Hey, what's up guys? So today I just wanted to do a quick video and talk about lighting and posing for volume shoots. I've gotten a lot of questions this week about lighting and posing from people who really want to know some information because they've got shoots coming up. It's that time of year. So I apologize if this doesn't flow the best way possible because I, even though I was planning on doing this video, I haven't really planned it out. So it might jump around a little bit. I apologize. I also apologize about the audio and video quality. I'm shooting this on my iPhone. I'm at my girlfriend's house. You guys can probably hear the smoke detector or carbon monoxide thing beeping in the background. I apologize about that too. It's all about the content and not the quality. So let's jump into this and talk about it. So the first thing whenever I think about lighting and posing that I'm going to look at for my shoots and I'm going to assume this time of year you guys are going to be doing out time, outdoor shoots. I'll do another video and talk about indoor shoots. I just want to get some content out here real quick. But so I'm assuming you're all going to be outside. So that means the first thing you got to consider is where's the sun going to be. I figure most of you are probably going to be doing late afternoon shoots after school, that type of thing. Uh, if you're going to do an all day Saturday type shoot, you're going to probably have to make some adjustments or figure something out. But typically for me this time of year, it's going to be late in the afternoon. We're going to start around five or six o'clock, which means the sun is going to be well, to my left, which would be west. The sun will still be fairly high in the sky, but by the time we're finishing up, the sun will be getting lower in the sky and maybe even setting, depending on how long the shoot takes us. So typically when I do shoots for our volume shoots, I want to get the sun either behind the people that I'm shooting or I want to put them in complete shade. I really don't like dealing with side lighting because what's going to happen, one is you've got to balance that exposure out and all that, and it just becomes a problem. But as it gets later in the day, you're gonna be making changes to your camera settings to try to compensate for that side lighting, especially as the sun gets lower in the sky, it's gonna have more of a dramatic effect and it's gonna impact your exposure that much more. And when I do our shoots, I want to make as little adjustments as possible to my camera or to my flash power. I wanna be able to try to shoot everything as consistently as possible. That way when I'm done, I can go into Lightroom and if there's anything that needs to be done, I just make global edits to all of the images or at least large portions of the images without having to go through on each individual image and make adjustments. It's just so much quicker that way. And then when you're dealing with side lighting, especially late in the day, it just, it really starts to become difficult to balance that lighting out quickly because the exposure is gonna change so rapidly as the sun's getting ready to set. So typically this time of year for our volume shoots, I'm gonna talk about individual pictures first and then I'm gonna talk about team pictures second, because for me, it's a completely different setup. So for the individual pictures, I'm typically gonna use two lights this time of year. So once I figure out how I'm gonna position these kids based on the sun, then I'm going to try to figure out my background. Now for me, in my area, for a lot of what I shoot, we are not gonna photograph on an actual playing field. Usually the playing fields are in use and we just can't get access to them most of the time. We're usually relegated to either a practice field or a park, uh, maybe not even a, like a, let's say we're photographing softball. We may not even get access to a softball diamond. We may be stuck in a park or something like that. So typically I'm not gonna have anything nice as a background to uh, take my photographs at. If I do happen to get an actual facility where there's a nice scoreboard or something like that, I'm typically gonna try to get that scoreboard or uh, the gymnasium or something that maybe has a team name or logo or something in the background to kind of showcase you know, what the team name is, what the mascot is, something along those lines. But typically I don't have that luxury. Typically I'm gonna be shooting on, like, like I said, a practice facility or something where all we've got is like a chain link fence or you know, maybe a green backstop or something that's just not that attractive. In those situations, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pull those players as far away from that fence or that nasty backstop that's falling apart or, you know, whatever it is that we're shooting at. I'm going to pull them far away from it as possible. That way I can try to at least knock it somewhat out of focus, if not completely. So I may go to the complete opposite side of the field away from whatever that background is going to be and shoot from there going back. One of the mistakes that I see parents make a lot of times when they do like team photos and stuff like that is they'll put them like right next, right in front of a dugout. Very few dugouts look very good. You know, most don't, most aren't very attractive. They've got chain link fencing running on them because of safety reasons and things like that. And so it's just very unattractive background. I know it gives a sense of place, but it's just unattractive. 
if I can pull them out and all the way across the field and still show that dugout in the background, but maybe a little bit out of focus to still give a sense of place, but it's out of focus, it's usually much better. I also wanna make my subjects pop out from that background the best that I can. And by having that out of focus background, it just makes your subject stand out more. A lot of times we're relegated to shooting in parks, especially whenever we do youth organizations and things like that. In those situations, what I do, if we're in a, like a public park, you're gonna have people walking around, all kinds of problems like that. But typically what I do in my area is, most parks in my area have a sump area in them. I assume it's like that just about everywhere, but I don't know that to be true because I've never visited a lot of parks outside of Southern California. But in my area, they have these sumps because they are designed in case the city ever floods, they've got some place to drain a large amount of water because they're still green and they have grass and trees and things like that. That way I'm not dealing with cars in the background parked on the street, houses or people walking their dog or any of that kind of stuff. Usually I can manage to just get that sloping green background behind them and knock it out of focus and it just looks for a much better picture. If we try to shoot up at the same level as the park, we're going to end up with houses and it's difficult to get a house out of focus or a car. Even though we can knock it out of focus some, you can still tell that, oftentimes you can still tell that there is a car in the background or the shape of a house, that kind of thing. And I just don't think it looks very appealing. One other thing to look out for when you do these kinds of shoots, look out for trash cans. On a couple of my first shoots, my first year, I didn't pay much attention to it. There was an errant trash can somewhere in the background and people complained about it. And so now it's something that I always look out for is a trash can somewhere in the background. So once I've got that squared away, now we're gonna deal with our lighting and our posing. Typically when it comes to my lighting setups this time of year, I'm gonna use two lights and I'm just going to set them up basically at uh, 45 degree angles, you know, one off to the right, one off to the left. And it's gonna be a very flat lighting setup most of the time. When you do flat lighting, you simply don't get complaints. If you try to get too dramatic with lighting, you might have a parent complain, somebody doesn't like it, that kind of stuff. If it's a relatively flat lighting setup, there's really nothing that people have to complain about. And now granted, I don't necessarily do a one-to-one -one lighting ratio. I might have one flash at like half power and the other one at full power, but it's typically not gonna be a very dramatic lighting ratio. And the reason why I primarily go with two lights this time of year is simply because the sun is so bright and it's so difficult to overpower the sun this time of year. And what I'm able to do that way is I'm able to use less flash power on each flash and still get a nice lighting pattern on their on their face because I don't want to really use full power flashes this time of year if I'm doing large groups, three, 400 kids, because one, if you're using one light, you're gonna need extra batteries. Two, here in Southern California, you run the risk of overheating your batteries, your flashes, your power packs, that kind of thing. And I've had that happen even using two lights in the past on, on really hot days. But by lowering my flash power, it just really helps to conserve those batteries and it makes things easier. I use one light setup sometimes this time of year if I'm using, if I'm doing smaller groups or things like that. But it can be tough depending on what you're using to get enough flash power out there. If you're using speed lights, one's probably not gonna work. Yesterday I shot some uh, kids from my son's track team and I was using a 200 watt second Godox light and it just wasn't, it, I was struggling to get enough flash power just to give a little bit of fill flash on the kids. <clears throat> if I'd been using a studio strobe, it wouldn't have been as much of a problem. But with that 200 watt second light, which is much more powerful than most speed lights, it just was struggling as a single light to get enough light on them to be able to fill in some of the shadows. So if you're gonna use speed lights for your individual shots, you're really gonna probably have to have two this time of year. In situations where I do use one light, I typically am going to either use it with the C-stand and just fly it directly over me, or I'm going to just put it off to the side and I'm gonna be right up next to it, almost just a direct blast of flash directly in their face typically. I typically don't worry about a hair light this time of year because I'm gonna use the sun most likely as my hair light. But as it does get darker, if you're shooting up until sunset and around that time, you may need to add a third light in there just to give a little bit of a rim or a hair light on them just to make them stand out from the background a little bit more, especially with people with dark hair. Now, typically I like to use soft boxes whenever I do this. Again, simply because of power issues, the soft box is gonna contain that light and force it all out the front. I'm not gonna have any wasted light, you know, with like a shoot through umbrella where a lot of that light's gonna get reflected back because of the umbrella. I tend to use like a reflective umbrella so that my flash isn't being wasted and bouncing back into nowhere. 
because I just really want to conserve flash power, especially with the larger shoots. With the smaller ones, it's much less of an issue because I'm not going to be out there long enough for it to really affect my battery life. So as far as posing goes, I try to limit the options that the kids have. That's not to say that kids can't come up and tell me that they want to stand however they want and I won't take the picture. If mom comes up and says, I want my kid to pose this way, that's fine, go for it. But I don't like to leave it very open-ended for the kids because otherwise you're gonna have kids come up there and they're just gonna go, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And then you give them suggestions and they're like, I'm not sure and they're being shy and it's gonna slow you down too much. So we do one of a couple of things. Either we basically start with a pose and we direct the first kid to do it and we tell them the rest of the team, hey, watch this kid. And then we just try to get them to run through doing that same type of pose. Or what I've started doing the last two years or so is I've created these pick a pose charts and we post these around for the kids to look at and then they can look at them before they get up there and pick which pose they want to since it is baseball season, if anybody wants to use this pick a pose chart that I made up with my beautiful fiance, being a photographer is great, you get to meet all the hot chicks. Um, I will uh, gladly make this available for anybody that wants to use it. You just obviously can't sell it because, uh, well, it's got the Dodgers logo on it and I don't want to get sued. But if anybody needs to use this, just uh, leave me a comment below and I'll post it on my Smug Mug or something for people to download and use if you guys want to use it. And we direct the kids as a team, but when they, we bring each team over, my assistant will direct them to, hey, take a look at this, figure out what pose you want before you get up there because it just really slows things down a lot. I typically don't do a multiple pose uh, shoot with our kids. I've done it in the past where we have parents pick a pose and stuff like that where we'll take the kid in different poses, but I don't like doing that because it really just slows down the process to have to show the parents and have them look and go, oh, I don't like number one, I want number two. Well, maybe then the kid says I want number one, and it, it just slows you down too much. I don't, I do everything on a pre-sale basis to where we're not posting them online for the parents to pick later. I just want them to pay now, and then they'll get their pictures in a couple of weeks, and that's the way that it works. I've just found that it just really complicates the process to do online sales later. Uh, you lose a lot of sales because people may be well-intentioned and plan on buying things, but your, your sales rate, in my experience, it just drops if they don't make a purchase that day. And confusing the process with showing parents pictures because inevitably they're going to say, oh, I don't like Jenny's smile, can you retake the picture? And then it just slows down your process. If you're doing large groups, you don't have time for that. If we're doing it like, let's say, a single traveling baseball team where we're only gonna go out and photograph 17 or 18 kids, which I typically don't like to do because there's just not a lot of money in it. I mean, our sales tend to be a little bit higher per kid when we do that type of organization, but I would rather make less per kid and do several hundred kids rather than go out and do 20 kids and you know make a little bit more money per kid. I do it sometimes more as favors to certain coaches and, and things like that that I know. But one thing that you are going to want to do is before the kids get up to your photographer, you want to make sure that your assistant tells the kids, hey, if you have a special bat, special ball, something like that that you want to use in the picture, get it now. Don't let them get up to the photographer without whatever they need for their photo because it's just going to slow you down. And you don't want to get behind because once you start getting behind, it just snowballs. What happens is the more teams you get there at one time, that means more kids. Kids get restless. Coaches will start gossiping. They won't be paying attention to the kids. Then you're going to start having softballs fly around. You're going to have kids running into your background. We've been hit by soccer balls. We've had our equipment hit with softballs and stuff like that because when we get behind, there just ends up being too many kids there to control. And it gets loud and then you can't hear and there's just way too many problems. So we try to stay on schedule for the simple fact that we want as many, we want as few people there as possible. Quick tip, if you're photographing younger kids, you're probably gonna end up with some kid that is crying and doesn't wanna take a picture. It happens all the time. You're also gonna end up with parents that are screaming at their kids to smile and to smile right, which only makes the kid more nervous and then they don't wanna behave or they don't wanna smile properly. In my experience, a screaming parrot never works to get a good picture. So typically what I'll do when we have those crying kids is I'll tell them, hey, why don't you go take the team picture and then bring your kid back? Because oftentimes by sending them over the team picture as a group, they get a little bit more comfortable with the photographer and then they come back and they're not crying. Sometimes it doesn't work, but 
it's better than sitting there dealing with one kid that is hysterical for 10 minutes just to get a picture of a mom basically holding him by one arm while you take a picture. I've literally had that happen before. So that's just something I found that works some of the time to be able to get the kid to calm down and come back and get a good picture. So once they're done with their individual picture, we're gonna send them over for the team picture. Typically, I am going to have a second person there this time of year to photograph the team picture because we're just gonna have too many teams and I don't like to use the same lighting setup for both. I know that there are some photographers in my area that use a single light. Basically, they'll set a light behind them and they'll put it up and they'll shoot down and that'll be the lighting for their individual picture and that'll be the lighting for the team picture. I don't like to use a single light for a team picture because basically you end up with a hot spot in the middle and then it fades off at the edges, which just is not a very good picture in my opinion. I watched yesterday as the company that my son's high school hired to photograph their teams. He used a single speed light on top of his camera for the individual pictures and then for the team picture they used one studio strobe that was set off to the side and they just shot it back across the team. And the problem is, is you end up with one side of the team having the shadows filled in and the other side doesn't. I, I don't like that setup. We do typically a two light setup whenever we photograph the teams. If I'm photographing a very small team, like let's say a golf team where there's only six or seven athletes on the team, I don't mind using a single large parabolic umbrella behind me and shooting it that way because the group's small enough that the light is gonna cover everybody and it looks good. But anything more than about seven people and you're just gonna end up with the middle basically being well lit and then the people on the edges are gonna fall off into darkness and it just doesn't look very good in my opinion. So once they're over there with the teams, this is where you're really gonna need studio strobes to shoot outdoors. If you're indoors, you could probably get away with speed lights, but if you're outdoors, unless you're gonna gang up you know, four to six, maybe even eight speed lights, you're probably not gonna be able to output enough light to actually really affect your image whenever it comes to the team photos. So we use studio strobes. I recommend something around a 300 watt second or more depending on the size of the team. I use the Alien Bees B800s typically for these kinds of shoots. Um, I also have some newer, I forget the model number, I'll leave the link in the description, um, strobes that I bought on Amazon. They cost under 100 bucks a piece and they're supposed to be rated at a 300 watt second. I think they're a little bit less than that, but you can still get a decent team picture for, you know, a softball team that of maybe 20 people or, or around that amount. If you're dealing with larger teams, it's not really football season, but if you were doing like, let's say a football team where you got 40 kids, you're really gonna need a high powered strobe to get a decent picture. When we used to do our team pictures, we would typically use like large, like I said, seven foot parabolic umbrellas. We'd use two of them off to the sides. The problem is, is when you're shooting outdoors, those large parabolic umbrellas are like boat sails and they just catch the wind. And it doesn't take very much wind to basically blow your equipment over. And so we would oftentimes have to have our assistants over there holding those things down. And it just was a big problem. And so now when we do our team pictures, we typically just use the speed light with just a reflector on them and we just shoot it like that. One thing you're gonna to wanna to make sure you do, get your, get your strobes up high. You're not gonna to wanna to blast it from eye level because you're just gonna end up, you know, basically throwing shadows from the kid in front onto the person behind him. So get your lights up high, shoot them down, that way the shadow is falling down and behind the person and not showing up on the uniforms. You're probably still gonna end up with a little bit of a shadow, but I wanna to try to minimize the shadows falling on people in the back row as much as possible. TSS actually has some really good information whenever it comes to posing teams online for their franchises. I'll leave a link in the description. You probably wanna jump on there, download it before they realize that it's set to everybody in the public can access it, but it's actually a really good guide on team posing. So jump on there and grab that while you can because they may end up putting it into their login area or something once they realize that it's publicly accessible. But it's good information. Basically what they tell you is don't end up with two really long rows of your team because it just doesn't look good. You end up with a bunch of negatives, a bunch of dead space at the top and the bottom of the image and it's just not very attractive. They also go into how many people should be in each row and stuff like that and so it's really useful. I don't often photograph a lot of teams. Typically I have my second photographer there and he's kind of the master at posing teams because that's what he does most of the time. But you know, typically we're just gonna avoid those two long rows. We may end up with a third row if we need to, where basically we'll have the first row sitting, second row kneeling, third row standing, 
Uh, we do different things like that just to try to balance it out. But like I said, TSS's guide is really thorough and does a good job of explaining it all. Personally, I find uh, the team photos to be the most challenging because inevitably you're gonna have somebody there who's gonna screw around, they're gonna joke around. It, oftentimes it's gonna be the coaches, it's not even the kids that are gonna be doing something that screws up your shot. So we're gonna fire off several team photos. We may fire off five or six, uh, just to make sure that we've got everybody looking, everybody's eyes open, that kind of stuff. I tell parents flat out, we're not gonna Photoshop kids in. If you miss your team photo, tough luck because you don't wanna deal with it because what's gonna end up happening is the kid's gonna show up, you're shooting outdoors, so the ambient light's gonna change, so the exposure on that kid, the color balance, all that stuff is gonna be different. It could be different whenever you photograph that individual kid. And so now you're trying to add that kid into the team photo and it's just gonna be hard to make it look natural. And I don't wanna deal with it, it's not worth it. Too bad, you missed the team photo, I'm not gonna deal with it. But you are gonna get asked that a lot. One thing that I forgot to mention whenever it comes to posing the individuals and also whenever you do your team picture is you've got to remember your cropping ratios. When you shoot a picture, typically with most cameras, you're gonna be at basically a four by six uh, format, which is, you know, rectangular shape. One of the common things that you're gonna have is you're gonna have eight by tens that are gonna be purchased probably more than anything. <clears throat> and depending on what size wallet you offer, it might be an eight by 10 or a four by five ratio, same thing as an eight by 10, which is almost a square. It's still a little rectangular, but it's almost a square. So you've gotta be careful when you photograph this stuff that you leave enough room to crop that image. I've run into this problem where we've shot the team photos really tight and then whenever we got back and we had to do eight by tens and we had to crop in, you know, we're running into cutting people off on the arms. So then I had to go through, design a border template to be able to put these images into and it was just work that I didn't wanna deal with. Some people do borders with the team name and stuff like that anyway, so if you're planning on doing that, it's not gonna be as much of an issue but we typically just do a borderless print and that became a little bit of a problem for me. Also on your individual pictures, whenever you're photographing, I don't like doing full body shots because one of the things that you have to deal with is you have to factor in the eight by 10 crop. So if you do a full body shot, you've gotta make sure you leave enough space from head to toe that you can crop into that eight by 10 ratio. Whenever we do things like let's say soccer, we get a lot of kids that wanna stand on the soccer ball. And so if I don't leave enough space in there, if I shoot relatively tight on the kid, what ends up happening is I'm cutting off part of the soccer ball, I'm cutting off part of the head, because I always forget to leave that extra space. So make sure that you do shoot wider than you would normally do, because you've gotta factor that in. When you shoot a three quarter body shot or you know an upper body shot, it's not as big of a deal because if you crop let's say at the thigh versus the waist, it's not gonna make it a, much of a difference. It usually doesn't impact our image. The only thing that might happen is we may cut off part of a hand, which is something I try to avoid. I try to make all my crops to where either it's like at the middle of the forearm or below the hand. I try not to crop off at the hand because it just looks a little bit weird. But whenever you're doing three quarter body shots or upper body shots, it's typically not gonna be much of an issue on your crop. But when you do full body shots, it becomes a very big issue because you can't really cut part of the image out. Which that also reminds me, whenever it comes to posing, you have to remember you're gonna have kids with various athletic abilities, especially when you're dealing with like recreation league sports. When you get into high school or like traveling clubs and things like that, where it's a little bit more competitive, it's much less of an issue. But when you're dealing with like recreation and youth, really young youth sports, the ability of these kids to follow directions and do certain things is gonna vary greatly. So something as simple as putting one foot on the soccer ball is going to be a challenge for some of these kids. Even some of these kids in rec league that are older that you think would be able to stand on one foot and balance another foot on a soccer ball, it can be a challenge for some of these kids that aren't very coordinated. And so I try to avoid something like that, like the standing on the soccer ball. I don't encourage it. If they ask for it, obviously I let them do it but I don't encourage it because you're just gonna have so many kids that are gonna come up and they're not gonna be able to balance. And you're gonna be trying to time your shot to, before that kid falls off to the side. And it's just frustrating, it creates a mess. And I, I try to avoid that. So I try to keep the, the poses as simple as possible. Like for baseball, I don't really care much for when the kid comes up and they do the whole baseball, the, the hitting pose, 
because what happens is they hold the bat so high above their head, you have to either crop part of the bat off, which I don't really like, or you end up with the bat taking up the upper third part of the picture. So typically I tell the kids, come in for a more relaxed pose, just rest the bat on your shoulder. And I think it looks, personally, I think it looks much better and we actually get a better response from the parents in the end. They may come up and say, oh, I want my kid to stand like this. And then whenever I show them the difference, almost 100% of the time, I'd say like 99% of the time, they end up telling me they like the more relaxed pose better. But anything even remotely complicated, especially for the younger kids, I try to avoid. I mean, something as simple as holding the bat out in front of them and doing that kind of pose, it can be a challenge for some kids to even remotely stay still. Even the bat over the shoulders and having the kid look back, I've had kids that have had a very big challenge trying to get into that pose, especially when they were younger. And one of the things with me and the folks that I work with, I tell all of my assistants, don't touch the kids at all. Not that I don't trust my assistant's judgment, but I just want to avoid any kind of problems or any kind of complaints, anybody to perceive something wrong. Maybe mom sees something from a, a bad angle or anything like that. So I tell my sisters, don't touch the kids. Don't help them get posed at all. We can direct them, but we're not going to actually touch them. We always have a parent or a coach come over and they will actually navigate and move these kids if we need them to get moved into a certain position. It just, it avoids complaints and... You know, just this last year, there was a situation with the mall Santa that swatted a kid on the butt uh, playfully, and it turned into a whole big controversy for him. He got death threats, things like that. I don't know what the kid, what the Santa was thinking, swatting a kid on the butt that wasn't his, but it was a very playful thing, very innocent thing, but it turned into a very big mess for this man. And I just don't want any kind of complaints like that to be even associated with my company. And so I just tell my assistants, if somebody's hair is out of place, hey, mom, come here, come here and fix it if the kid can't get it done themselves. So sometimes the poses can be a little bit difficult to get the kid exactly the way you want it because I see it in my eyes and the kid's not understanding, but I'm not going to move that kid at all. I'm going to have a parent or somebody come over and, okay, I need them to get their left shoulder back. I need their head this way, whatever the situation may be, and direct the uh, adult to help get them posed. Just my personal preference, my piece of advice to you guys, because I know that 90% of the people that watch my channel, according to YouTube, are middle-aged males here in America. And let's face it, as a middle-aged man, we are inherently creepy in the eyes of most people. I just don't want anything to get misperceived and deal with those kinds of complaints. It's just my, my advice to everybody. The only time that I will allow my assistant, and this is probably gonna sound wrong in today's day and age, but the only time that my assistants will ever help get people posed is on the occasions that I have a female assistant. I will let them help the girls to get posed or fix their hair or things like that, but I don't have very many female assistants that help me. I'm sure somebody out there is gonna say that I'm wrong for being old fashioned and having that thought process, but that's just the way that I was brought up and raised. So I'm sorry in advance. So with that said, I hope I covered everything in there that I needed to cover. Like I said, this was a little bit rushed. Uh, I hadn't really sat down and formulated a thought process on everything that I wanted to talk about. So if you guys have any more questions, leave me a comment below and I'll try to get it answered in another video. So I hope this helps those of you out who've got shoots coming up here in the next couple of weeks. Go out there, have fun, take a lot of pictures. And uh, if you guys have any questions, like I said, just leave me a comment below and I'll do my best to answer it. Thanks for watching guys. Have a great day.